Welcome everyone. It is now five. Recording in progress. Five oh two, I believe. Welcome to the uh, July twelfth Land Use Transportation Committee, and actually his first committee uh, in person. So bear with us. We have some uh, growing pains to do some hybrid and some other things with us with us in person. Uh, by our call this meeting to order, and I'd like to introduce. We have committee member Council Member Moore. We have committee member Tran. Who is online not with us today we have council member linda coach bar council president susan honda with us today is there anyone else did i miss somebody at all Do you know uh, and lydia no. i don't know if council member Sefa Dawson is online yet okay i think she was planning on doing that all righty we'll just continue then well, welcome everyone and now we're down to public comment rebecca i think we had one Okay. So the first one we have is Mark Sparr. Did I say that last name correct? Thank you, Mark. Come up to the podium. Three minutes. So I'm speaking on behalf of Roger and Jane Vandenhoff. They couldn't be here today. But um, talking about the traffic study for the elimination of the extension of 376 and 19th Way uh, to the Milton Road. To refresh your memory, when the, the redevelopment and the rezone of the Milton Road area was zoned to 7,600 square feet. Attached to that in the council was to be a, tra a traffic study to eliminate the extension in the comprehensive master plan. Well, in the intervening time, um, the people have uh, gone through and four developers have proposed on developing the property and four of them have passed on de development because of the requirement to extend the road through a wetland. All agree that it's expensive and, and practically cannot be done. The Vandenhofs um, are, are committed to, to helping with the getting the redevelopment done, even though they were initially not in favor of it. They would like to keep their home. They plan to stay there for the rest of their lives, but the road extension would be within 17 feet of their current home. Um, this, this extension that's in the comprehensive master plan is just a deal breaker. It's caused them to have to start over and over and over again with different builders to, to propose redevelopment of this property. Um, so in short, we ask that the traffic study be done so that this extension can be eliminated or that the council just vote to eliminate that requirement from the comprehensive master plan. Because right now, this redevelopment is not getting done. Um, and I, I hope you remember that this council chamber was filled with people who were very interested in this, in this issue on the extension. Now you've got both sides in agreement. The people who want to redevelop it and the people who don't want the road ext extension are very clear that they don't want the road extension done. If we can't get movement on this from the city to get this, uh, this elimination done, I, I anticipate we're going to get more and more people here to express their displeasure on getting this done. Um, I, I, the people want more housing here in, in Federal Way, and this is an opportunity to get more housing near the new transit center. Let's work together and get that done. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Rebecca, did we have a letter? Yeah, I'm not sure we do have a second comment. I'm trying to reach him via email because I 
Hold on. I have one attendee. Yes, here he is. I'm going to promote him to talk. His name is Ian Morrison. Hello, Ian. Ms. Hello, council members. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you, council members. Uh, for the record, my name is Ian Morrison. I'm a land use attorney with McCullough Hill Leary, and I'm commenting on behalf of Merlone Geyer Partners, which owns the commons at Federway. Um, and I do want to say thank you to Stephanie and Rebecca for um, helping on that. I know this is the technology is evolving. Um, and so I really appreciate your staff in allowing me to comment remotely. Um, I'm here to comment on the draft housing action plan, which is before you today as topic E. And on behalf of Malone Geyer, which owns the commons at Federal Way, um, we are really excited about the direction of the draft housing plan and have appreciated the work that staff and the planning commission has done. I distributed um, a letter, I believe Rebecca or Stephanie distributed a letter. Uh, one thing that we wanted to call your attention to, while we believe that the direction of the draft housing plan um, is moving in the right way to look at uh, incentives for multifamily housing, especially in the city center, um, I want to encourage the council uh, to look at the implementation plan, which is on PDF page 66 and 67 where it talks about what is the timeline for these implementations. While we think the substance of the policies is moving in the right direction, I would really encourage council, as you are thinking about working with um, the mayor's office and the executive committee, to look at specifically how do we bring forward the evaluations of regulatory and financial incentives in the short term particularly around city center to ensure that the work that the city has done setting forward the city center plan can really facilitate public private development. Um, we at Merlone Guy are very hopeful to be working with the council and the city very quickly to look at um, significant infill transit oriented development at the commons. Uh, one of the things that we think could be one of those low hanging fruits that we would encourage the city to move forward in the short term as opposed to the medium term is items like enhancing and extending the planned action ordinance um, around the city center with SEPA review that will ensure a quick, predictable process for reviewing new projects uh, in the city center. And the other item, um, which is strategy six in the draft housing plan, which is re reviewing the school impact fees on multifamily housing. As I think most of the, as the FERC report indicated, these school impact fees are a significant, um, it's significantly higher than peer cities in the region and is one of the factors that we believe is leading towards a lack of redevelopment and development opportunities. Um, and so while we are excited to see that the city is putting this annual review on the draft work plan, we would encourage that that be something that has moved forward very quickly um, and, and hopefully are able to get to some clarity around what is the appropriate um, match for those school impact fees, particularly in city center, because uh, we can say Merlone Geyer has looked at opportunities to redevelop right now and the current school impact fees, even with the council's reduction, um, make it cost prohibitive to do significant density around transit. And so what I think I'd leave you with is we really like the direction that the council is moving and the city is moving, but would encourage you to move some of those items, including item five about incentives and item six about the school impact fees to the short term calendar um, for implementation so that we can see hopefully some of those policy ideas come to fruition, uh, which will support transit oriented housing in the city center. Thank you for your time and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Ian. Um, is that all we had, Rebecca? I think Council President Honda, you had something you want to read. It's with the housing action plan. I think I'll do it then. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So we're gonna move on to committee business. Uh, first talk. Yes. So, uh, thank you. With regard to the two items that have already been commented on, um, the first item, South Three Seventy Six extension. That's not on our. Mike, please. Oh, sorry. South 376 uh, extension. Uh, that's not on our agenda this evening, but I'm wondering when that's going to be discussed. Do you have any idea? I have no idea, Rebecca. Do you know? Rick? It's so nice to see you. <laughs> In person. I recognize him from Zoom. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, so for the record, Rick Perez, city traffic engineer. So I've had the draft scope from our consultant on this on my desk for quite a while, trying to get to it. Um, 
lot of competing workload right now and um, but I'm aware of the issues I'm aware of the sensitivity and um, I think once we get going um, you know we'll be having an open house meeting to make sure all the issues are out on the table and uh, then have the consultant do the work um, I will say we did have one pre-application meeting with um, one of the developers um, and so the issue of whether the roadway is in the comp plan or not um, we still have the city's block perimeter requirements and that dictate some kind of connection would be made and we counter proposed an alternative apparently that still was not adequate so um, for the development community so I'm not sure exactly how we're gonna resolve that I think it will be you know a council decision ultimately um, but yeah it's there's a lot of issues to sort through thank you Rick so can you tell us can you give us a, an estimated timeline so these people aren't held waiting? so um, it's really tough given the workload issues but um, I would hope to have the consultant underway by the end of the summer um, and if not sooner and uh, we should have the whole thing wrapped up by the end of the year so this is a particular consultant just for this particular so project. the consultant we're using is one that we have an on-call services oh, contract okay. with thanks uh, thank you Rick and then maybe I'm not sure if you answered this question, but Chair, my second question is with regard to um, the second commenter on the housing action plan and the multifamily housing in the downtown core. I believe that we um, put a zoning uh, um, hmm, to hire a consultant for zoning for the downtown core that was to be in effect on July 1st, but we still haven't heard. I haven't either. About that. So, do you know anything about that, Rick? Whether that's oh goodness, we have somebody else coming. Brian, forward. no. Brian's Oops. coming up. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. So the money that we were given by council was to um, look at the downtown. We did interview the council and found that much of the desire of the council is consistent with the comprehensive plan. So we are in the stages of determining what would be the best way to implement that, since the plan is already in place. Um, we, the, you, nobody, nobody interviewed me. We set up interviews, so if, it, if I, I, I think we did talk to you about the downtown, yeah. about the zoning for the downtown, about the what the downtown, what the council wants for the downtown. Right, we did, but I, I'm asking if we're going to hire a consultant. We, right. we put the money in the budget for a consultant. Yes, to look at the downtown. So what we wanted to sit down with the council to identify exactly what the council wanted. Because right. some said zoning, some said others, so we didn't know what we were dealing with. Right. And so when we interviewed the council, what we took back, or what we received was implementation, a desire for implementation of what was already in the comprehensive plan. And so that's what we we're determining on how to Take the well, next then steps. I think I need personally a review of the comprehensive plan for the downtown because I'm pretty murky about it. Okay. So, and I thought that's what we we're going to do with a consultant. Yeah, we can get you that. And part of that was because I'm concerned about low income housing in the downtown. Yeah. So, um, when we, we, we heard that, we heard about what the station needed to be looked like as far as the light rail. We heard a, a lot, a wide range of things for the downtown that was not just zoning and not just low income right. housing. So it's a, it's a bigger picture than just. Right. That's why we wanted a consultant to look at it. Right. But so now we're, what we want to do with the consultant is determine how to implement what the council wants. And there's varying opinions on the council what the, of the downtown is. And so it's implementing what we were trying, what the council wants for the downtown. And we're right in the middle of that right now. Council President, do you have anything to say on that? So someone will be hired to work with us on this? Yes. OK. So, so you are hiring somebody? We will be, yes. OK. But not right now? No, we're not. We're, st we're still. Uh, what, we, what we were surprised is that the council's desire was, it was precisely consistent with the comprehensive plan. So there was no, as a result of that, there was no need to go back and revision the comprehensive plan. Well, so it's just a matter of implementing at this no, point. Sure. So maybe what we need is a review of what our plan is for the downtown, for the comprehensive plan for the we, downtown. We certainly could do that. But it, 
it was it was consistent with what we heard back. So if we want a briefing on what the comprehensive plan says, we we can certainly do that. Council President, are you agreeable hold with on, that? Hold on. Yeah, I think we'll take this out of this meeting and um, okay. agree. Maybe we can meet with you, Brian, and talk to yeah. with you. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so we're back down to. Yeah, I was just going to add, more, chime yeah. in here, and that, yeah, and that's. Uh, I mean, perhaps we can get a briefing on the comprehensive plan, which is what you're asking, either in the committee or maybe full council during a special meeting would be something that kind of comes to my mind, just to respect uh, the thoughts here. So, okay, thank you. Why don't um, let me have a meeting with Brian Davis, and then I'll get back to you guys on that. Okay. Sounds good. Okay. Thank you. So again, item A, approval of minutes from uh, June 7th, 2021. So I think yep. I'll entertain a motion. Uh, Mr. Chair, I will uh, move to pass the minutes as they have been submitted. And I'll second. second that. I have a first by Councilmember Moore, second by Councilmember Tran. All those in favor say aye. 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 Pass unanimously, 3-0, thank you. Down to item B, Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout Bid Award. I believe that's Christine. Good evening. I'm Christine Mullen, Senior Capital Engineer for the City of Federal Way. Mm -hmm. Just one second. All right, I'm going to be presenting the Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout Bid Award. The question before you tonight is, should the City Council authorize staff to award the Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout Project to the lowest responsive, responsible bidder and return to the LUTC, and, that should be in return to Council, and authorize the Mayor to execute the contract? So this project provides a compact roundabout at the intersection of SR 509 and 47th Avenue Southwest, um, along with associated retaining walls, storm drainage, and illumination improvements. And a roundabout at this location serves as a countermeasure to the fatal and serious injury collision history at this T intersection. And right now it is a stop controlled intersection. On the minor leg, I should add. So this here is just a, a photo showing the current intersection. So we opened bids for this project last month on June 11th. We received four bids. The lowest responsive responsible bidder is Sound Pacific Construction, LLC, and their bid amount was $1,057,128. So for the cost for this project, um, our design costs uh, was just over 200000 There's no right-of-way that was required for this project. Um, in there I have the construction costs that Sound Pacific's bid was with, along with a 10% contingency and then a construction management budget of 178000 for total project costs of just over $1.5 The funding for this project, right now there's $15,000 in city funds that were transferred from um, balance on other capital projects. As part of the request tonight, we're requesting a transfer from the Transporta Transportation Capital Fund in the amount of 168907 and 80. We have a federal grant for 
1.1 million and then we've contacted WashDOT. The bids came in over budget. We've contacted WashDOT and are requesting additional federal grant funds in the amount of 264,000 that um, is part of their um, like emergency COVID funding that they're still authorizing for projects. So the options for consideration are one, to award the Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout Project to Sound Pacific Construction LLC, who's the lowest responsive responsible bidder in the amount of $1,057,128 and also approve a 10% contingency of $105,712.80 for a total amount of $1,162,840.80 and also authorize the transfer of $168,907.80 from the Transportation Capital Fund, which is the 306 fund, and transfer this to the Southwest Dash Point Road and 47th Avenue Southwest Compact Roundabout Project which is project number 36217 and authorize the mayor to execute the contract. Option number two for consideration would be to reject all bids for the project and direct staff to rebid the project and return to committee for further action. The mayor's recommendation is to forward option one to the July 20th council consent agenda for approval. Any questions? Thank you, Christine. Any questions from our committee members? Can you remember more? Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. Um, it says an additional $168,000 is recommended to be transferred to the project from the Transportation Capital Fund. Mm -hmm. um, is that impacting anything or um, any other projects if we're taking money out of that account? No, I believe, and Desiree, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe that's surplus savings from other capital projects. That is correct. So um, we have. Um, somewhere around 600, 700,000 in unallocated funds that are um, left over um, from other project savings, as Christine said, that we can utilize for these projects. So depending on how much contingency we actually use and how much, um, if we use a consultant for our construction inspection as opposed to in-house staff, we may, may not even need that. But at this point, we wanna make sure we're covered. Okay, thank you. Commissioner Tran, do you have a question at all? Because I can't see you. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Christine, I do have a question. I'm looking at the document that included in the, uh, the package, my package, is show bid number one, two, three, and four, but also it show a column where it said engineer's estimate from KPG Inc. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what that is? Um, so when we design projects, we put together engineer estimates, which is just an estimate of what we think it's going to cost. And so in this case, it was, um, it should actually be DKS for this project. So that was a typo. Um, but DKS is the consultant for this project. And so that's what they put together for their estimate of costs. And then the bids came in obviously substantially higher than that engineer's estimate which is why we're requesting the additional funds from WashDOT as well as the transfer from the Transportation Capital Fund. Got it, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Council President Honda. Uh, thank you. When uh, will this project be started and how long will it take to finish? Um, we are anticipating starting it if, if everything goes well and it's approved um, at Council on the 20th, we would start work probably either August 1st or September 1st. Um, and I believe there is, I want to say 90 or 100 working days for this project. So we would try to get as much done still this year as we could. Um, it might potentially carry over into uh, early of 2022. Will the roundabout be um, completely solid or will it have an area for plantings in the middle? It is completely solid. Um, okay. It's a mountable roundabout and given the volume of trailers and stuff that are going to Dash Point State Park, we wanted to make sure that they could get around it with no problem. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Council Member Uh Thank you very much, Chair Brewster. I, I thank you very much, uh, very detailed um, backup. I'm just wondering why our uh, engineer's estimate was so much lower than the estimate, than the bids that came in. 
Yeah, it, it's substantially lower. There's not any one item um, except for, I believe, the retaining wall. So the retaining wall on this project is going to be a not a normal block wall like we put on a lot of projects. This one's going to be a soldier pile wall. And I believe that they underestimated that quite a bit, which was where a large amount of that cost was. Overall, I think it was just bid prices are high right now with petroleum prices being high, asphalt prices are high. It's just, it's just that it's so much lower, it just kind of glaring. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Any more questions? You know, questions or take a motion. Mr. Chair, uh, I move to forward option one to the July 20th, 2021 City Council Consent Agenda for approval. I'll, I'll second that. Motion by Committee Member Tran, seconded by Committee Member Moore. Any other discussion on the motion? No discussion. All those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3 0. Thank you, Christine. Thank you. Move on to item C, authorization to apply for transportation grant. Rick Perez. Mr. Perez, the floor is yours. Good evening. And if I can find the right thing here. Here we go. Where did it go? Ah, here it is. <coughs> All right. And Oh, that's right. I always forget to use that one. All right. Um, policy question is, should the council authorize staff to submit a grant application for a transportation project? Um, and this particular transportation project is our project at 99, SR 99 and South 373rd Street. So a little bit of background. The State um, Transportation Improvement Board um, has their annual program um, for improving safety, mobility, physical condition, and supporting economic development. So we had applied for this before, um, didn't get it. Actually, we've applied for two separate grants and didn't get them. But uh, we have since met with uh, TIB staff to review our projects that are on our current transportation improvement plan. And uh, particularly in light of the notoriety of the recent uh, fatalities there um, concluded that this project would be very competitive under the safety and mobility categories. And so um, what we are proposing is a combination of a roundabout and access management. So um, this was a preliminary design and the design has um, shifted a little bit, but the idea is to construct a roundabout at 373rd and then um, basically prohibit all left turns with median barrier between Gethsemane Cemetery and the way station. And uh, so that um, those driveways in between would um, be able to make a U-turn at those locations. Um, so it addresses a um, safety and capacity issue at 373rd. Um, also, a accommodating a development that is going to be occurring in the city of Milton that is, is subject to um, a mitigation agreement that they will be helping fund this project um, that would add um, something on the order of 73 trips an hour um, to this intersection. So, um, what we're asking at this point is um, to construct this project, design right away in construction. We're estimating a total of 3.5 million, um, expecting to apply for grant funds to the tune of two and a half million, which would require a city match of one million. And that would be funded out of a combination of transportation impact fees and the real estate excise tax. So if we are funded, we would propose to go into preliminary design in 2022, um, final design and right away acquisition in 22 and 23 and construct in 2024. 
So um, options considered is to authorize staff to submit the proposed application or two, do not authorize staff to submit the proposed application and provide direction to staff. The mayor's recommendation is for option one. And with that, happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Rick. Any questions from the committee members at all? Okay. Council President Honda. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> So I've noticed along Highway 99, they've lowered the speed to 40 um, through Milton and Fife, it's 40? Uh, I drove through it today, it's 45, 45? Hmm. In, fi uh, in Milton, and then it drops to 35 at the new roundabout at Wapato Way. Then I think it goes up to 40 again. But I could, could be. Be, I could be wrong, but I think that's what I saw. So are we going to, is that going to be consistent all the way through Federal Way? So currently it's posted at 50 in Federal Way. Um, and due to the driveway density, I mean, part of the problem is, yeah, there's folks, it's posted at 50. Um, we haven't done a speed study out there, but I expect a lot of folks are going closer to 60. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and given the limited amount of driveways in that area, um, it's very rural in nature. And so we could post it at whatever we wanted, but it's probably not going to modify driver behavior. Um, the crying need at these access points all along has been at least having a two-way left turn lane, which we proposed back around 98 and the state rejected the proposal because it meant having um, shoulder widths that were less than their standard. Um, and we haven't really had the funds to go out and widen all those. So um, that is why we don't have the two-way left turn lanes. And uh, even that in a 50 zone is not the best treatment, ideally. Um, it should be some type of raised median treatment to better control because the most and almost all of the collisions out there that have been so serious have been involving a left turn either from the highway or onto the highway. Um, and so that's what we really need to prevent out there. Okay. So my other question is that the new traffic circle in Fife. Yes. Um, I've gone through it a couple times. Um, I wasn't driving. I don't even want to drive through it. <laughs> <laughs> so will this traffic circle be large enough so that semis can go through without having to have cars make way for the semis? So we haven't gotten to that level of design detail yet. Um, and there's a trade-off here because the smaller you make a roundabout, the slower the speeds are in the roundabout and thus any collisions that do occur are much less severe. Um, but that means that trucks are going to encroach either on lanes or, you know, actually I drove through that roundabout today because I'd been hearing so much about it. Um, and first off, I'd point out that the west approach is still not done. Um, there's curbing that is still a long ways from the existing pavement out there. Um, so the geometry, especially on that west leg, is um, not the final. But it is pretty tight. I will also say that, you know, WashDOT has a renewed interest in making things as accessible for bicyclists and pedestrians as possible, which means keeping the crossing distances at the crosswalks as short as possible. So um, it remains to be seen, given that we have much less dense environment than Fife, to what extent WashDOT would require us to constrain the design that much. Um, so I think that's an open question. Um, certainly, we would aim for not having that lane encroachment um, by larger vehicles, but we may have to in order to keep the speeds at a reasonable level and to keep the pedestrian crossing distances as short as possible. Okay. Um, hmm. You know, is the goal to decrease the amount of semis on the on 99? 
Um, we have no control over that because it is a state highway. Right. Um, and frankly, I think no matter what we do, we're going to see a fair amount of semis anyway, either bypassing the scales, at least for northbound, and secondly, um, bypassing the congestion. Uh, if you've seen that uh, southbound off ramp at uh, exit 137, um, it gets pretty nasty. And uh, so I think a lot of the trucks are deliberately avoiding that interchange. Um, so I think that's something we're always going to struggle with, um, even though we would certainly like to discourage them from going that way. I, I, I don't think that you know, deliberately designing as tight as possible simply to try and deter trucks would be successful. Okay, I guess the cars and trucks need to learn to live together a little bit better on that road and yep. follow the speed limits and give each other space. Exactly. Okay, thank you. I think the major thing too, over there in that highway, if you take a look and see where all the RV places are building too, you know, there's a lot of them on that road now. And they take that route from, from um, the north end all the way into five, where all those places are, whether it be trailers, motorhomes, and things like that. So it's kind of hard to slow down a little bit. I actually have taken that one the other day. And uh, I might know where quite a bit, but I, I had my motorhome service and came through there. I wanted to see if I could take that turn. I really have to slow down. So, yeah, but it can be done, but I'm not saying that. But it, it, it needs to be, um, you know, um, great for us to be able to not s slow that down because I don't know how much building is going to be. Um, if you saw, like I said, it's a lot of RV places are taking those lots mm -hmm. on that route, and they're getting away from the congestion in five to try to get it away. So they might be more. So, yeah. Any other questions? Okay. If not, I'll take a motion. Can, can the public ask a question? No. Not that I know. Okay. It's up to you. you want to try? Okay. We can go ahead. So I'm going to let them you go. mentioned there was a, a development that was going to have impact to East Enderley. What development is that? Bridgepoint. So where the Lloyd Pit is, yeah. that redevelopment. Okay. How many homes are there? Do you know? It's um, actually commercial. It's commercial. Um, I can't remember the exact numbers, but somewhere close to a million square feet of warehouse type development. More trucks. Um, except spread over three buildings, if I recall correctly. The, the, the other nice thing that's going to be about that is that development will also be reconstructing Fifth Avenue and Milton, so they will be removing the truck restriction on that. So we should see a net reduction of trucks on Milton Road. Okay. That would be good. Yeah, I agree. Okay, Mr. Chair. Yes, thank you, Mark, for the question. Good. Uh, I'll move uh, to forward option one to the July 20th, 2021 council consent agenda for approval. Okay. I second that. Motion by committee member Moore, seconded by committee member Tran. Any other discussion on the motion? Hearing, seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3 0. Thank you. Thank you, Rick. Thank you. Move on to item D, or Ryan Midland. It's a resolution. That Declaring Town Center 4 as surplus property. Ryan. All right. Good evening, Committee Chair Baruso, Council President, Committee Members, and Council Member. Uh, my name is Ryan Medlin. I'm the City Liaison to Sound Transit, and I'm here tonight first to discuss a resolution to declare a city-owned property as surplus property. So the policy question tonight is, should the city council declare the property identified in the comprehensive plan as town center four to be surplus and authorize the mayor to execute a purchase and sale agreement to sell the property at fair market value to sound transit? A uh, little bit of background. In July 2007, the property was transferred to the city by sound transit after the construction of the existing Federal Way Transit Center. Uh, the purpose of the transfer at the time was to provide for an opportunity for transit-oriented development. Uh, since in the interim, the property was developed as a sculpture park um, and has remained undeveloped. Um, 
just as a side note, the remaining sculpture in all city property has already been removed from this property. Uh, there was one sculpture at the time of the at the time of the offer that the parks department took off. Um, an appraisal was uh, done by Sound Transit, and the city commissioned an appraisal review. Uh, the two documents determined that the fair market value of the property is seven hundred twenty-three thousand dollars, or about thirty-five dollars per square foot. Uh, the offer to purchase the property is. Uh, the buyer is known, it is Sound Transit, and they plan to purchase it at the fair market value, and the offer is for total acquisition. Uh, the proposed use of the property is a parking garage extension in support of the Federal Way Link extension, uh, so it is identified as uh, public use uh, should it be declared surplus. Uh, so option one would be to declare the property as surplus and authorize the mayor to execute a purchase and sale agreement with Sound Transit for the property. And option two is do not declare the property as surplus and provide direction to staff. Uh, the mayor recommends option one. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you, Ryan. Any questions from the committee members? Committee Member Moore. Thank you so much, Chair. Um, Ryan, um, you, you obviously just stated that, that the art was taken down by Correct. parts. Correct. What happened to that art? So I believe the art is actually owned by the artist, and they were trying to find the artist on Facebook was the last update I got. Oh, interesting. OK. OK, thank you. Member Mary Tran, do you have a question at all? I just want to make sure. Um, no, I don't. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Coach Uh The one at the end. <laughs> 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 thank you, Chair Berwissel. So, uh, Ryan, can you tell me uh, does Sound Transit, did they give any indication what they intend to do with the property once we sell it back to them? It will be a parking garage extension. Uh, okay. They're going to add on to the existing parking okay. garage to meet the uh, sure. additional spaces. How many parcels will Sound Transit then be, uh, have? How many parcels? Yeah, how many parcels of property will the Sound Transit be in control of in our downtown? Um, that's, um... So if you take the, it's about four if we kind of consolidate them. Um, I mean, legally speaking, the big, the big one in the middle there where they're building the station, I think is legally about six or seven. But when you, if I was to list them, I would list them as four. So if, so if you were to list the ones that could be developed for um, housing, would it be two, three, four? What? Oh, the many? surplus properties surplus. when they're done, you mean? Mm -hmm. That's four. four. Four pieces of surplus property. And on those four pieces of surplus property, how high can they go? I What's would, the height li limit? I would defer to the planning department because there are some factors sure. in it that can affect okay. what the maximum height is. Well, what I'm trying to get across here is that they will now be in control of four pieces, four surplus properties. I'm not sure how high they're going to go. I know that their goal is to have low-income housing next to the TO, as part of the TOD or part of the grant. Part of that, that's part of their mission. Uh, I don't blame them. That's part of the mission. Our mission is to protect our community, to protect our citizens. And so if you have a number of buildings that could go, on, I believe our former comprehensive plan said we could go up to 20 stories. I'm not sure for sure anymore how high we can go because I haven't seen that conference plan in a long time. But if, if you have a conglomeration of buildings down there and they will assume that everybody only has one car or no car, um, we're, we're going to have an influx of cars. Um, I'm glad they're going to add to the transit garage parking, but they're not going to build another parking garage at the other end down by the Costco area. We're going to have a lot of people coming in to park at that garage to take light rail. Um, my concern is that if part of their development is low income and we remove the school impact fees, which is what the Commons is asking for, uh, lower the school impact fees, I, I don't know what we're going to get. That's, I'm just saying publicly, that's why I thought we were going to have a zoner so I could get a, a zoning a planner so that I could get this explained to us. I, I, I'm not sure with our, I'm just trying to explain. I'm not sure with our comprehensive plan, I, I haven't seen it in so long. I don't know anymore what it says. 
and I, I think our mission is to make sure we know what we're doing. I don't have a problem with selling this as surplus property. It's such a small little piece. We had talked in the past about maybe building a two or three story building on it that would just be a small building and then having uh, the Chamber of Commerce in there. But, um, and using the parking garage to park in, but it, it's just too small. But, uh, so that's my concern. I, I need to have a review of what we're doing. Thanks. Got it, thank you. Council President Honda. Thank you, <clears throat> excuse me. So by declaring this surplus, and since we know that Sound Transit has already expressed an interest in this property, we don't have to put it on the market and let other people bid on it? Uh, correct, it's, since we know it's a bidder and the offer is actually done under threat of eminent domain, um, since it's the, for the project, they do have eminent domain powers. So if, if we had to put it on the market, do you think we would have gotten more money for, for the property? So the, the answer I'll give is that the appraisals um, both agreed upon the valuation of it, and it, they looked at four other uh, sales in the general vicinity, and all in federal way. Uh, this came, this wasn't the lowest out of that list. It was close to one of the middle ones. Um, and given some of the development issues that the property would um, face that Council Member Kochmar alluded to, that it's pretty narrow. Um, for reference, the width's about equal to two, per, two regular parking spaces and a parking lot aisle. So um, for any kind of practical development, it's very challenging. Both of those, the appraisals identified its um, highest and best use is basically to hold for see what the potential of it is when the station opens. So you're then talking about what will a speculator pay, which is um, near impossible to predict. Um, so um, I'm not qualified to give a okay. professional answer to the question, but um, the evidence that we've seen would lead us to believe that this is um, close to the amount we would expect to see if we put it on the open market. Okay, I'm, the only reason I'm asking is over the years, I've been told it was worth more than that, so. Um, by by some staff members, so thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. If not, I'll take a motion. Mr. Chair, I move to forward the proposed resolution to the July 20th, 2021 for public hearing. Second. Motion by Committee Member Tran, seconded by Committee Member Moore. Any other discussion on the motion? Here and seeing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3 0. Thank you, Ryan. I know you'll be back again for uh, the last one here. We're going to move on to item E, the draft housing action plan. Cheney Scanson. Cheney. Good evening, council members. I'm Janie Scatson, uh, associate planner and the project manager for the city for our uh, housing action plan. Tonight we'll be discussing the policy question, does the LUTC recommend adoption of the draft housing action plan? Um, in 2019, the city of Federal Way received a $100,000 grant from the Department of Commerce to develop this plan. However, there is no financial obligation to the city in presenting this information. So um, this uh, diagram here is kind of our roadmap to developing the Housing Action Plan. We began with um, pooling funds uh, of that grant from the Department of Commerce with six neighboring cities uh, or five neighboring city cities to do a sub-regional framework of that. Um, we studied broad uh, sub-regional trends and demographics, incomes, and housing stock. And with that information began our federal way specific housing needs assessment. The findings from that um, 
include that the housing production in, in federal way is the lowest in the, in the, than all the cities in our subregion studied. Only um, 5.3 units are produced for every 10 households over the last 10 years. So we have a low production of housing as our community is growing. The existing housing stock doesn't align with the community profile by size, by type, by preference, and by cost. Housing options are limited because um, and becoming more expensive, which is pushing home ownership out of reach for many. And nearly 40% of our households in Federal Way, that's 13,000, uh, are experiencing cost burden. That's when they're spending over 30% of their income on housing. This pro predominantly impacts renters and homeowners at 50% uh, and below uh, area median income. Uh, this uh, housing needs assessment the, we was kind of our qualitative analysis and the next box here, stakeholder engagement, is where we dive deeper into the qualitative findings. Um, and walkability, diversity, triplexes, townhouses, and uh, community were identified as the, or not identified, were just common words that came up throughout that community engagement. Uh, another element to our housing action plan was uh, diving deep into our housing policy, our codes, and our permitting review. Uh, this identified opportunities for potential code, uh, specific implementation, and a toolbox for um, future, um, or for, for, it helped design the strategies and uh, created kind of a toolbox for planners. Um, later, we used both the quantitative and qualitative information to develop our housing objectives that turned into strategies, and then we presented those back to the public with the public open house, and then uh, used the input and, um, of course, all of this with the assistance of our consultants to develop an impl implementation matrix and a priority schedule. And now we have a draft housing action plan. So this housing action plan intends uh, that the regulatory changes occurring after adoption be towards the goal of expanding housing options, housing choices, and encourage home ownerships, home ownership opportunities, and plan for an increased quality of life for the, as the city grows for the uh, current and future residents and people keep people in their homes. So these are the, the four objectives. Promote new housing development that expands housing choices and is inclusive of community, to community's needs. Encourage home ownership opportunities and support equitable housing outcomes, plan for community growth, uh, for continued growth and ensure that the built environment promotes community development and increases the quality of life for better ways existing and future residents and uh, preserve the existing affordable housing stock to reduce displacement pressures. So uh, those four uh, housing objectives, uh, we des then designed these eight housing strategies to be able to achieve those objectives. Um, our first housing objective is to promote a dense, walkable, mixed-use city center. Number two is a similar idea, but on a smaller scale, to promote mixed-use, walkable neighborhood centers. Number three is to expand missing middle development opportunities. Missing middle is that housing typology that is in between the spectrum of large lots, single family, and high density apartments. This includes townhouses, duplexes, triplexes, other attached units. Uh, encourage ADU production. ADUs provide a um, unique opportunity uh, to meet uh, different or varying housing needs, such as those wishing to age in place, uh, younger generations uh, just starting out, and those uh, with development or um, living with disabilities that can be uh, close to their families or caregivers with uh, an independent lifestyle. Also, um, number five is to ensure that the incentives for mixed income housings are, housing is effective. Number six is to review our school impact fees on multifamily housing. Number seven is to coordinate to support affordable housing development and preservation. And number uh, eight is to, uh, for tenant protection, protections and pathways to home ownership. So um, the housing action plan and those strategies can be divided into three um, or we can imagine three separate housing categories that these housing or the, these strategies support. So there's market rate housing, there's income restricted housing, and there's the preservation of existing housing. Uh, the, of the total eight strategies, seven support market rate development. Uh, six support income restricted and two support the preservation of existing housing. There's a, a spectrum of housing need throughout the city um, and those, there's a variety of different types of housing that, that, will, um, that are needed to, to meet those needs. 
So in the short term, um, we have up here six of those strategies that we'll begin working on. Uh, this includes our city center promoting a, a dense downtown. Number two, identifying areas for walkable neighborhoods and uh, um, creating uh, more neighborhood centers. Uh, promoting ADU production by removing regulatory barriers. Uh, number six, uh, reviewing and adjusting as necessary our school impact fees on multifamily. Uh, preservation, working with organizations to preserve the um, existing affordable housing, whether it's naturally occurring or uh, uh, regulated, and then tenant protections. So something that you may see before the end of the year is our rental housing inspection program. So um, it's important that as we go through um, with this plan that we uh, have um, you know, continued monitoring our progress as we uh, attempt to achieve these these housing objectives. So uh, we hope that we'll have continued conversations and, and um, implementation milestones and, and periodic updates and review um, to evaluate our progress on meeting these objectives. So this could would include, um, you know, uh, council presentations and, and continued conversation as we evaluate our progress. So um, in addition, we spoke on June 7th, um, and this is now I'm going to kind of pivot the presentation over to some follow-up of, of those discussions. So involvement with the development community. Um, the Housing Action Plan worked um, in hand with the development community in terms of our outreach and engagement, but also I think it's important to stress that the adoption of the Housing Action Plan does not change any regulations. Uh, it is more so kind of creates a roadmap for how we can address housing need in the, the varying ways. And that um, implementation will include continued community outreach. So one thing that we used in the Housing Action Plan was an interested parties list, so an, an email e-newsletter that uh, those that are interested can follow along as we go along implementing this. Um, so there will be ample opportunity for organizations or, or developers and the community to be notified of when we, when we do take up um, implementing some of these strategies. Another um, question that was brought up was, uh, or a concern around HOAs and ADUs. So uh, the city of Federal Way um, can permit ADUs and, and we'll review our, our zoning regulations to do so. However, uh, conflicts can arise if uh, HOA bylaws may prevent that. So an a idea or, or way we can address this concern is uh, uh, when we go and update our ADU regulations, we'll include a requirement on our submittal checklist if the property belongs to an HOA to, to submit proof that the HOA has been notified of the application. Um, I'm going to move on to the next couple of slides here um, as we discuss the forecasting future housing units. So this here is a, um, is a map of the city with regions. We started looking at the zoning map. Um, well, so sorry, I'll take a step back. The yellow on this map is uh, where we expect the, um, the, the units to be developed to be primarily single family in those regions. The striped sections of this map is where we uh, anticipate the majority or primarily of those units to be either mixed use or, or multifamily. So we came to these loose numbers and regions of the city uh, by looking at our current zoning map, our development trends, uh, taking into consideration the buildable lands report of where there's capacity in the city and what's in the pipeline already. Uh, to, to come up with these loose numbers, an idea of where and what uh, we may expect when allocating those 6,800 units by 2040. And then this is um, the, in, in addition to the uh, st strategy number one, promoting a dense walkable mixed-use neighborhood to uh, include a, an action that um, as we develop our downtown that there be a, a wayfinding plan that is inclusive and accessible for people with disabilities. And that's some more details on that. So our, our next steps will be on uh, June 20th, taking the Housing Action Plan for potential adoption in, in front of uh, full city council. And um, here are the LUTC committee options. Option one is to recommend adoption of the draft Housing Action Plan. Number two is to recommend adoption of the draft Housing Action Plan with amendments. Number three is recommend adoption um, or recommend that the draft uh, housing action plan to the planning commission for further discussion and number four recommend forwarding the draft housing action plan to city council without a recommendation. 
the mayor's recommendation is um, adopt housing action adoption of the housing action draft housing action plan. Any questions? Thank you, Jane. Uh, one I have, could you explain the, uh, the neighborhood centers versus, you know, when you have on one of those uh, strategies between number one and number two? Absolutely. Um, they're similar in nature that um, near transit or amenity-rich areas, we should have higher density, supportive, compatible uh, residential uses. So um, downtown with the arrival of the link station, there's other locations in the city that also will be receiving um, uh, high capacity transit. So additional walkable centers are maybe not out of, our, not our city center core, but other places that will have access to high amenities or high access to amenities or amenity rich areas that would be compatible with um, more uh, dense uses and uh, you know opportunities for um, you know, promoting community development and, and walkable neighborhoods where all the amenities or, or needs of a family or, or um, household can be met in a short distance. Okay, thank you. Questions by community members? Can you remember more? Did you have something? I thought you did. No? Can you remember Tran? Any questions? Um, I'm good, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Council Member Kochmar. Thank you, Chair Baruso. So when you say uh, accessory dwelling units, are you also including in number four uh, detached accessory dwelling units? That's yeah. Be both. Um, so it's accessory dwelling units as a term is includes both. Um, detached so it, and detached. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then, uh, Chair, I, really, it, it's not for you. It, it's a, really a question for our council is, so, you know, I don't understand why we keep talking. Cause we're, we're confining our housing action plan, our, our decision making, to 2040 to the boundary we have currently but we haven't we don't seem to be including our PAA potential annexation area east of the freeway which includes about well it was 20,000 people I don't know how many people it is now but they do have you know I'm, I think it's something we should look at um, you know in our retreat maybe in January just a suggestion okay thank you Council President Honda thank you um, I have some comments from Planning Commissioner um, Diana Noble Gulliford. She was in a car and unable to get these written in time because um, we have a time limit now when you're writing public comment um, due to our hybrid system of meetings. And Chair Baruso said that I could read these for her. So these are her comments. One, removing single family zoning will increase our taxes as we will be taxed on highest and best use. Two, investors in retirement funds are buying up single family homes in our area, thus reducing the available inventory to buyers. This also applies to new construction of homes built, built to rent. Three, HOA conditions and rules will be negated by the permit process, thus forcing existing homeowners to litigate the subject property owner in court. The proposal on the table will destabilize our neighborhoods. Five, city center multifamily incentives and long range planning will be compromised by allowing wholesale multifamily zoning throughout our city. Six, taxpayers have invested $550 million in new school buildings for the future. Taxpayers are part of the school impact fee equation, not just developers and the city. Um, I also, those are her comments. I also have some concerns and comments. For an HOA, um, I do live in an HOA, and our HOA is very much controls what happens in our neighborhood. And uh, we have in the past started legal action against an owner who put the wrong roof on, and that uh, eventually did not go to court, but it was on its way to court. I'm concerned that This uh, could potentially take away the HOA's control or, you know, when people move into an HOA neighborhood, they're doing it on purpose because a lot of people don't like to be told what color they can paint their house and how to maintain their yards and stuff. But for the folks who do move into those neighborhoods, they do it for a reason. And the reason is that they want to maintain their property values and they want to maintain the consistency of the neighborhood and probably other things. I mean, we moved into the neighborhood because it 
the lot, we found a lot that fit our house. So that's why we, we moved there. But I'm really concerned about, um, about this. And I, I guess all I can say is that I just remain concerned. I, I'm, I, I do not want something that's going to overrule an HOA's covenants because um, people have agreed to live by those covenants by simply living in the neighborhood. Um, also, it's mentioned several times in this document, condos and multifamily rental units. How can we get condos built in federal way? I, you know, that's been an ongoing discussion for years. How is that going to happen? Just this document isn't going to make it happen. So how are we going to, because it's going to be up to the city council and zoning and all sorts of stuff to make it happen. And I'm, I, I, I want condos. I think that they're very much needed. But I, just because they're listed in here doesn't make it happen. So, and then um, you mentioned um, that we might have something to say about the 272nd train um, station, the development. How could we have anything to say about that when it's not in federal way? And one last question is, can the schools handle the influx of new home, homes, um, especially multi, the, the multifamily? It's, there's quite a bit of multifamily that's indicated in this um, document. Right now, um, as Diana mentioned, you know, we have a huge bond that went out to, to build the new schools. They're not all built yet. And it'll be a while before we can go out for another bond and for schools. So are, are the schools capable of handling this? And have the school district, ha, have, has the school district said anything about this document? Absolutely. Uh, there is a lot of questions, but I might. I'm sorry. No, no, it's okay. I'll work backwards and please remind me. Because if I don't ask now, I'll ask next week. So. No, thank you. Um, so uh, I'll start with the, the um, we had a member from the Federal Way Public Schools on our advisory group. So she was um, involved in the discussions. And um, the school impact fees are, uh, a, it's hard to strike a good balance. Uh, historically, it's either benefited the city and development or the school district. So this strategy is meant to, to try to find a, a balance that won't prohibit or be cost prohibitive to development while also um, you know, supporting our schools. So the, the strategy as it's written is, is we're going to review and continue to partner with the Federal Way Public Schools to, to find a solution that, that works for both. Um, in terms of, I, I think that's all I can say to that. Um, but do you want to remind me of another one of your questions? Oh, the Sorry. Sure. You know, it used to be you're on mute. Now it's put your mic on. <laughs> HOAs and ADUs. Yeah, so um, there's differing like governing bodies here. So the the HOAs are a civil matter, and and like you mentioned, the process between the roof, it, it's not something that the city would get involved in. But uh, one way we're hoping to mitigate those issues is if the HOA is notified before the applicant or the property owner that belongs to the HOA before they even submit their application, that could maybe be resolved before permits are paid for or issued or anything, you know, of that nature when it becomes, you know, a surprise to the HOA. That's why um, the submittal checklist for anyone wanting to apply for an ADU would, if, if it belongs in a, uh, if the property is within an HOA, uh, proof of notification to the HOA would, would be required. So it's, it's the, that um, is that effort is, is hoping to be a mitigation technique to, to I, I, I kind of bring attention to what's happening before you know um, it can cause any uh, you know uh, issues. But but it's 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 legally um, not some, like currently ADUs can we could still review ADUs and, and we we won't be reviewing um, you know, HOA bylaws in terms of what will permit or not, because they're just kind of different, separate tracks. Condos. 
Sure. Um, so that's a that's a great question. Um, condo development, uh, you know, ever since the, the financing behind it has been, I think it's like 1995 Condominium Act that has made the um, liability really high for building condos. Um, in terms of a good way to get it, I think that um, you, the, the housing action plan doesn't necessarily identify, you know, the difference between the two and, and how we can support it. But um, that that's not, uh, I guess I don't have like a, a, a concrete plan on how to attract condos, but the, the same barriers for multifamily development apply to condo development. Paying multifamily school impact fees that is pretty prohibitively high keeps both of those developments from happening. Um, other development regulations uh, also impact both types of development. Calling out condos specifically on how those will be developed, I think that uh, unique opportunities could uh, present themselves between, um, you know, uh, development agreements or, or other mechanisms outside. But in terms of what we can incentivize, I, I don't have an answer. Right, and uh, the 272nd Sound Transit train station. Yeah, so I, I did mention 272nd, and, and it does border part of the city, and if we wanted to um, consider a sub air plan around that, since it is along the property, or the, the boundary line, but I also should have mentioned the Sound Transit 3 is what is more, um, uh, it makes more sense uh, in terms of the being within the whole city, but that, that's a, a, another opportunity for a neighborhood center. Um, that that uh, would require additional long-range planning and uh, possibly a, a community plan. Um, is Kent doing anything? It, it's be, it belongs in Kent, right? That's the I think it is along Kent, Des Moines, and Federal Way, so it's right at this Tri-City area. Um, I believe that there was conversations. I don't think anything has, uh, there's no type of agreement between the three cities if they're uh, allocating any resources or efforts to it. The Do point. they have surplus property over there also that they will be using for possible um, housing? I, I'm not sure. Okay. And um, I guess uh, my last comment would be um, really for the council that this is a really important document, extremely important. And before next Tuesday, I would encourage every single council member to read it if you need a paper copy because I did request a, a paper copy so I could make notes on it. Um, Jerry Lynn will be happy to, to get one for you, but it's an extremely important document. We should all be qu asking questions on this. We should all be um, reading every single page and understanding what's in here because this uh, is extremely important. So. That's what I will say. Thank you for your work. I know you've worked really hard on it, and thank you very much. Because Member Goldschmore? Well, I might have an idea on the condo issue. Um, I, I did speak with a, a person from Associated General Contractors who said, you know, it's a, a market right now that everybody, all the cities, want to have development happening. And the, the, his suggestion was that we go to the developer that we want, that we want to have develop in our town, we actually go to them as a, a, a council team or as a, we reach out to them. They're not going to come to us. We have to go to them. And so that really is maybe part of what our, ship, our plan should be, to be proactive. And yeah, I want a paper copy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I agree, Council Person Hall, that uh, we need to take a look at that. It is a lot of information in there. It's really comprehensive, uh, Cheney. In regards to, to HOAs, do you know the number of HOAs can even afford to put, uh, like the older, some of the older HOAs, like Twin Lakes, stuff like that, are there, is there any land to put some type of ADU in there? You know, there's newer HOAs, right, that still have, are pretty spread out, and then there's the older ones. Do you have a number at all of, of ADUs that possibly might come in the city if we did this? So. ADUs are accessory dwelling units to a primary structure, so those those can be built on an exi existing lot. So you don't necessarily need more land to you don't you can't put them on just land. They have to be accessory to an existing structure, um, as long as all of the development conditions are met. Um, if I understood your question correctly, or if not, please. No, I no, it's right. I just I'm just kind of trying to figure out which HOAs, uh, the newer ones I know have more land. 
the, the density is a little higher in the older ones, the HOAs. So I'm just kind of wondering which HOAs are out there that still has that type of, uh, folks have that type of land where they can add on like that. Mm -hmm. That's what I was kind of looking for. But So I'd be happy to go over the, the development regulations that, um, that need to be met in terms of like being able to develop an a, a attached or detached dwelling unit. It's, um, it, it's, you have to meet minimum lot size and you have like a maximum impervious surface. But in terms of like uh, density, that's not uh, an issue. Okay, thank you. Any more questions? Okay, you're in seeing none, I'm gonna take a motion. There is one. Mr. Chair, I uh, recommend uh, forwarding option one to the July 12th, 2021 City Council business agenda for approval. This motion for a Committee Member Moore, is there a second? That's um, July I have 20th. a question the, on the day that July 12th so probably. or to July 20th. Should be the 20th, correct. Uh, Mr. Chair, I'm going to remake that motion if that's okay. Go ahead. Uh, the committee recommends uh, a move uh, to recommend forwarding option one to the July 20th. Uh, City Council business agenda for approval. Thank you. I will second that. Motion by Committee Member Morris, seconded by Committee Member Tran. Any other discussion on the motion? Thank you for the catch. And just for the record, Mr. Chair, um, business agenda simply means that we're going to discuss it and there'll be a presentation yes. made for the public. Yes, thank you. Very thank you. Here and seeing then, all those in favor say aye. 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 Motion passes 3 0. Thank you. Thank you, Janie. Thank you. Ryan, Ryan you're back up. The item F, uh, progress update on sound transit activities. Good evening again, council, uh, committee chair, council president, and committee members and council members. Um, my name is Ryan again. Um, updates on the Federal Way Link Extension today. Uh, clearing and grubbing activities are still continuing along I-5. They are expecting to get those done um, through the rest of the year. Um, they've started grading, and you may have seen that they've started constructing a wall just north of 288th. Um, and in addition to that wall, and they're grading out um, kind of an access road that they'll use as they build the guideway along I-5. Um, and then up by Mark Twain, they are uh, continuing work on the column on the south side of 272nd there, and as well as doing some restoration work that they've agreed to with the when I thought I'd made every technical error this year. Um, so up by Mark Twain, they're also working on some restoration work for the school district um, that they've agreed to right now. It's some utility works and they're working on uh, some parking lot improvements and maybe a new portable this summer. Um, utility relocation has started in coordination with Lake Haven along uh, South 320th Street. They're working at night. Uh, most of the days are gonna be Monday through Thursday. Uh, and they'll take up to two westbound lanes on 320th. Um, this is expected to go on for um, a good number of weeks. Uh, and we'll also expect to see the first girder deliveries to the city center area for the uh, future station. We expect those in August, and that'll be when you start to see the uh, aerial guideway structure down there go horizontal in addition to the vertical work we've seen. Uh, As for the operations and maintenance facility, we still don't have a date yet on when they'll um, identify a preferred alternative. Um, when I spoke to them earlier today, uh, they confirmed that it was uh, real, it's been put on pause with realignment work that they've been doing. Um, so it's still expected to occur this year, but we don't have a date at this time. Uh, with the Tacoma Dome Link extension, again, it's most of it's on um, pause as they handle the budget framework. What's actually happened in between when I wrote my staff memo and 
today, and because it was on my staff memo, I forgot to put it on the PowerPoint, but uh, we obviously sent that letter from last council meeting to the Sound Transit Board. It was entered into the record at their system expansion committee on July 8th, and staff also provided uh, verbal comments reiterating the need for parking to be provided um, as par in concurrently with the new station with Tacoma Dome Link Extension. Uh, so before I actually go to questions, I'd also like to just kind of add a kind of a status update on where we're at with their surplus property discussions because it's come up a couple times tonight. Um, we're not, there hasn't been anything to bring forth because those conversations as with OMF and Tacoma Dome have sort of been moving slowly. Uh, the current status of what Sound Transit staff is working on is doing a scope of work to do a market analyst consultant um, to look at the properties around the Federal Way Transit Center um, and kind of evaluate, hopefully in an objective sense, evaluate what the potential for those properties would be. Uh, this would then feed into public outreach that's expected to occur. Hopefully it's later this year, it might be early next year since a lot of things schedule-wise seem to be getting delayed. Um, and then once we get this kind of scope of work and I can, I'm confident that they're in a place where there's some ground beneath their feet. I'm hopeful that um, both them and the council will figure out a time to put them in front of you about that topic specifically. Um, I don't, ha I haven't discussed a timeline with them on that one yet because the next meeting with them, it's all, every time I've talked to you the last three times, I think it's been the next week and that's no different today. I have the appointments on my calendar for the next week, but um, Hopefully, as their realignment settles down, um, it becomes the day, not next week. So uh, that would be my comments on surplus property. And I guess, um, Council President Honda, before uh, you asked about 272nd and surplus land um, to Cheney. I don't believe the 272nd station has any surplus property. I'm not going to be 100% confident in that because it's been a while since I've seen the development map for that site. I know they have some at the Kent Des Moines station across from Highline College uh, that they're a little bit further along in the surplus property process and they actually just did their round of the public outreach about that process. So um, I don't know about the 272nd one. I can double check but I'm I, d I feel like there's none there because it was basically they took an old park and ride property. Um, and it's all going to be either the station, the parking garage, or stormwater facilities, et cetera. So with that added side notes, I will take any questions. What? She was first. OK. Council so, Member Coach Brown. Ryan, so that's really what I'm saying is that my mother, who's been gone for many years, would have said, we're putting the cart before the horse. And so what that means is that if a developer is going to come in and buy a piece of property from Sound Transit to develop, mm -hmm. well, they're going to want to look to see what kind of grants they're going to get, for example, low-income housing, but uh, they're going to look at a comprehensive plan because the plan is going to be what's going to tell them what they can build and how high they can go. And so, and what the building's going to look like, what the facade is going to look like, you know, whether there's supposed to be any walking paths or kiosks or whatever, that's going to be in our comprehensive plan. It's like the plan that they follow, and they're going to look at that and so that's why I'm very concerned about looking at a comprehensive plan before we get to the point where they make the decision on what the development would be. Council President Honda. Thank you. Do you know if Sound Transit will be holding meetings in person or are they still going to be remote? I believe the state is headed towards telling all of us that it has to be in person. But my guess would be they follow the state guidelines, the state mandate. Okay. Um, but I haven't actually asked them that, no. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Thank you, Ryan. We move to item G, the last item on our list here, payment condition preservation program update, Desiree. Desiree Winkler. Uh, good evening, Chair, Committee Members, Council President Honda, Council Members. Uh, 
Let's see. All right, am I good? No. Uh, go new share. Yep. And let's just go that way. Yep. And share. All right, thank you. <laughs> All right, yes, yeah, so I'm here to give you an update on our um, current payment conditions, our preservation program as related to the newly implemented as of last September solid waste excise tax that is dedicated for pavements. All right, how do I forward it? <laughs> there we go. All right, so I'm gonna give you a little bit of background information just so that you know um, people know um, the background of where we're at and how we got here today. So the overall condition of the roadway network has been deteriorating over the past 10 years. Council's direct to staff that maintaining our roadway network is a priority um, for everything, for mobility, safety, um, commerce, economic development for the city. Uh, relative to the reduction of the overlay funding, inflation, increasing requirements for our overlays, the budget has been less and less and we've been less able to keep up. Uh, Council asked for ideas on how to review to see if there's some additional funding. We, um, as part of the new solid waste contract last September implemented a 10% excise tax on solid waste and recycling that is dedicated to pavements. So our pavements are arguably our largest asset that the city owns, 241 center line miles or 548 lane miles. If we had to rebuild all that pavement, it would be over $300 million. That's in 2019 dollars. Um, we rate our streets on a biannual basis. Uh, we hire a contractor that drives every single pavement, looks at every crack. Um, and currently, um, we have a pavement condition index, index or PCI, uh, that is a 75. And that was compared to an 86 that we had uh, in 2007. So, we have an overlay program that we do every year. Um, we base the priorities on the PCI ratings. Um, we have had to, from 2017 to 2020, limit our overlay program to the arterial network because we just haven't had enough funds to dedicate to anything but the arterials. Since our arterials are the highest volume and the highest speed, you know, the risks associated with failure of those pavements is a lot higher than the low volume roads. Um, we have to match obviously available budget. We um, recommend an overlay list and we bring it to council every year for approval. So the PCI or pavement condition index is rated from zero to 100, on 100 being a brand new pavement. So these are a couple of roads that we've paved in the last year, First Avenue South and Southwest 356. Those are at 100. Um, as the pavement starts to age and deteriorate, cracks um, show up. And so here's a couple examples of PCIs that are more in the kind of fair to poor, good um, condition uh, with the 42 example on that side. And then as they continue to deteriorate, we get what's called alligator cracking and these are more like pavement condition indexes uh, for, of a 37 and a 30, and um, con considered very poor. So again, the history of our budget that was dedicated to overlays, um, in 2007, 2010, it was about $2 million a year. 2011, with um, impacts from the economy, recession, the, the um, annual program was reduced by about a half a million dollars and has remained that way until recently. And the overlaid miles is something that um, you can see based on over the years, the cost per ton of asphalt has gone up as just the cost of everything goes up. In 2007, with $2 million, we can overlay like 13.7 lane miles and then 
go down to 1.5 um, or go down to 2017, and we're averaging about five lane miles a year. Um, and in that same time, the pavement condition index overall reduced about 10 points from an 86 down to a 75. In comparing um, in 2019 um, dollars of how much money is put in per uh, center line miles with some of our neighbors, um, and we based it on center line miles. Um, Auburn, who actually recently in the past five years implemented some additional taxes also as well to bring up their dollars per center line mile. They're spending about $15,000 per center line mile. They have an average PCI of about 74. Um, go down to the bottom, Tacoma, who is historically known in the area for having some of the worst pavements around. They had to really dig deep to come up with their current funding of $24,000 per center line mile. And they're going to be hard pressed to ever catch up <laughs> to bring their rating up. We sit, um, we had sit historically fairly low um, with our 1.5 million a year. That was only about $6,300 uh, per center line mile. Now that has um, doubled, and we'll talk a little bit more about the additional funds we're getting in for uh, the solid waste tax. So pavement condition um, and pavements is just like anything you own, your house, your car. You can pay a little bit now to maintain it regularly, or you can pay nothing now and just let it deteriorate and let it fail and pay a whole lot later on. So let's talk about a car. You wanna change your oil every 5,000 miles and you can keep it in good con running condition or you can never change your oil and then five, you know, two years down the road, you'll be replacing an engine. That's the same thing with pavements. We can pay a lot less when the pavement condition is in good condition versus when it deteriorates. So even in the time when we were at an 85, at that point, in order to maintain a steady state, we were probably needing $2, $2.2 million a year in order to maintain that 85. But because we reduced the funding for so long and we lost our payment rating, uh, we're at a lot higher dollar value just to keep steady state and keep from failing or falling anymore. So there's a couple graphs I'll show you is kind of looking at what's the 10, next 10 years look like. Um, in order to maintain our rating around a 75, we need about $3 million a year. Um, if we had continued down the road of the $1.5 million a year in 10 years, we would have expected to fall another 10 points and our payments would have then been at a 67 10 years from now. Um, this is just another graph on how to show that, that at the green line there, hopefully it shows up for everybody, at $3 million annually, we're able to maintain a steady state. The purple line was previously what we were going to have at 1.5, again, seeing that reduction of the PCI down to a 67 after about 10 years. So why the solid waste? Uh, fee or excise fee is that the trucks are heavy and they're getting heavier all the time um, just how they do business so pavements are basically um, they're designed to handle loading and the lighter the car the more loadings you can handle well one fully loaded collection vehicle is equivalent to about 1500 cars on the same street I argue it's probably even more than that um, so the repeated heavy loading on these low volume roads that generally have very thin pavements because they weren't contemplated to have to handle all of that um, is pretty hard on them. So that's, that's why it made sense. And there's other, other uh, jurisdictions who have followed and have done this or have done it before us, I mean, um, implementing this 10% excise tax on solid waste and recycling. We started collecting in September of 2020 with the new contract. Um, so what that means is that this 10% is dedicated to street overlay funding. 70% of the red revenue must be used on residential streets. So we're tracking it. 70% of it has to go to there. 
The remaining collected revenue can be used on other streets, so we can use it for arterials, we can use it, you know, maybe to match the grants that we go for, that type of thing. Um, it has to add to the existing overlay program. The ordinance was very clear that it wasn't, they, they could not supplant funding, so it had to add to it. Um, again, implemented with a new contract September 2020. So the projected revenue we um, received in um, 2020 as we started in September is about $685,000. We are projected in 2021 to collect about $2 million. So when we came forward with this um, in the probably August, September you know, time frame, I think it was earlier than that because it was before the contract, that it was estimated that the annual revenue would gonna, was going to be about $1.5 million. And we looked at that and it was based on what the current waste management contract was bringing in. So we took that amount and said, well, it would be about 1.5 million. What we found is that waste management revenue is actually higher than what we anticipated and they have to pay us based on their revenue. So that's why we're collecting more. And in addition, um, with the changes in the excise tax ordinance, we are also collecting from the other haulers. So, um, you know, junk by Earl or, <laughs> um, you know, anybody, uh, contractors that bring in anyone that's going to haul waste or recycling from their property, we're collecting from them. And we worked with finance to make sure that everybody was paying fairly um, because it, historically, um, it didn't look like we were collecting from everyone that we should have. So we went on a, quite a campaign to make sure we informed everyone. Letters were sent to all the businesses. And so far this year, I think we're predicting, we are projecting we would get over $200,000 from those other haulers. And that revenue may go up and down. It really, I mean, it, a lot of that could be construction related. The waste management contract would probably stay pretty steady because you know waste, you know, solid waste is something that's pretty ne necessary and doesn't go up and down with with recession and those type of things. But those other hauler revenues could change. So we're pretty excited. We restarted the residential overlay program this year. We identified the areas based on the payment condition index. We are looking as the years go on to distribute the funding throughout the city. So we're not gonna park and just do one, one neighborhood. We're gonna make sure we spread it around. And this year we were able just on the residential overlays to do about 4.8 lane miles. We basically doubled our overlay program this year from what we have been able to do in the last um, five, six, seven years. Um, in 2022 we predict that we'll be able to pave about 5.5 lane miles. Uh, so we do have on our website the proposed like multi-year overlay program. And so it's hard, I know it's hard to see because it's a really big map, but you can certainly pull it up on our website and look at it. This shows um, both the residential and some additional arterial uh, projects that we are um, proposed to pave over the next uh, three or four years. And then these are some of the pictures of uh, the residential uh, overlay program in Marine Hills uh, this last year that we were able to do. Uh, in addition, the, the city crews uh, were able to, to do quite a bit of paving this last spring. Uh, they take on some of the like the really really low volume roads, and they also um, restarted the gravel road paving program. We actually do still have a handful of gravel roads out there that we are um, and had been directed previously to try to like pave one a year, and so we restarted that uh, this year. And then in the lower uh, right corner, you'll see that's a crack ceiling operation, which is really important toward our pavement preservation. Um, another thing that we've been doing that we've in, in, enhanced and are doing more of is our patching program. And uh, in, in a contract actually will be coming to you and I think direct to council later this month to award a patching program. And we were doubling that program as well. It's also a very 
important and good strategy for us to be able to do these pavement patches uh, as well to preserve our pavements. Um, again, uh, we've got a larger patching program that we've doubled from 150 to 300,000. City crews paving on projects. And in, in addition, uh, we propose that uh, we could use this uh, additional funds for paving, but toward um, paving equipment for the crews. One thing that a lot of cities have is called a patch, we call a patch truck or patch unit. And what it does is that you can go and get hot mix asphalt and keep it warm. So you don't have to, right now what we do is we have to basically open the hole and then drive and get the hot mix and bring it back and put it in you know, the hole. And anything we don't use gets wasted. Um, and this way we can actually plug the, the patch unit in overnight and save all that mix and actually be productive first thing in the morning versus having to go and truck and bring it back. So um, that's something that we propose to implement. And then the one thing we didn't do is um, the staffing. Um, we are using existing staffing and, and consultants with this doubling of the, the pavement program, but we're trying to look and see what makes sense in order to make sure we can um, keep it sustained. So in summary, the new solid waste recycling excise tax revenue um, will prevent further degradation of the PCI with the, the revenues that are coming in. We've reinstated the residential overlay program. We've increased payment repair budget, and uh, we look forward to some future improvements, including equipment um, and then appropriate staffing as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Desiree. Uh, just a comment from a gentleman in the North Lake area that did some paving. He's very, very appreciative and uh, loves his new road in front of his house. So we want me to relay that. <laughs> uh, any questions? I, I think it's some. a great program. But go ahead. Uh, Council President Honda. Thank you. Um, so besides the, you know, we have comments from one of our citizens on, on this program. I think this is probably why we're talking about this today. But are we hearing from any other citizens in the city concerning this um, extra f tax? I haven't heard any. I, I think once when the when the bills came out, you know, there were quite a few questions because the rates had changed depending on what you chose, and then there was another line item, right, mm -hmm. or an increase in a line item in there, and and we got quite a few calls as as we would with any of our. Um, you know, swim fees or other fees. Um, but other than that, no. Once we answered the questions about, um, you know, where the fees were going, um, most people understood, and that's it. So um, the roads that are chosen to be repaved every year, it's based on the PCI. So we take the, the worst roads first, to repave them even in residential areas yes uh, for the most part and you know there's we call it like a sweet spot we we want to get them before they're too failed um, but honestly some of the residential roads are, are so thin and there's really not much to be able to do so um, most of the areas that you see where we're gonna do the residentials we're gonna rip up all the asphalt and put down a brand new um, layer of asphalt because we just can't even overlay it because there's not a it's not a good enough structure. Okay, and I have two more questions. How long is the uh, crack ceiling expected to last? How many years will that once they seal it will that last? Um, the cr the crack ceiling itself. You know, depending, it really, it's really dependent on um, the condition of the pavement initially when you seal it. Um, depends on volume. It depends on a lot of um, even environmental factors. In areas where it's shaded, it actually will last a lot longer because it's not getting oxidized as much. So, you know, ideally, you, know, you want to be able to come in and say pave the road within five years of crack sealing it because you, if you don't do that, you're gonna see that there's more cracks that show up. 
next to the cracks. And so, um, again, it's dependent. Crack sealing can last up to five years. So if you've gone through a residential area and done a lot of the crack sealing, that um, residential area can expect to have their streets repaved within five years? I hope so. <laughs> that would be the goal. Okay. And the last thing you said, um, you said that uh, something about increased staffing, but this does not cover staffing. This does not cover staffing, but it does cover the pavement program. So part of implementing the program is that our staff charge to the program when they're either doing design work or they're doing um, the inspection. So when we plug in how much it costs, that, that it, when we say steady state is $3 million a year, that's all in. That's not just asphalt that goes on the ground. It's not $3 million of asphalt that goes on the ground. It's every bit of the construction from the traffic control to the ADA ramps that we have to update, to the striping that has to go down, to the traffic loops you have to replace, you know, everything, including then design costs as well as inspection. So the program has to be able to cover all of that. And like I said, we track our time um, that we charge when we're working on those projects, so. Okay, thanks very much. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Any other questions? Any comments from anyone else? Great report. Thank you, Desiree. Thanks. Thank you. We're down to other, any other business at this time? Customer Tran, you still with us? Yes, I'm still here. Okay, just, just checking. Thank you. Chair? Yes. I, I'd like to thank staff. Um, and I, I just can't even name you all because you worked so hard to make today happen. Agreed. So uh, thank you so much. I, this is, was really important to council to be able to come back and have in-person meetings and it was important to our citizens. So I know that it took a lot of work to have us sitting here and I, I, I know we really appreciate it. So thank you so much. And you've Good. done a great job. Good, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, again, so uh, future meetings. Again, we're going to be back on August 2nd, 5 o'clock here at City Hall. Uh, again, a reminder for our council members for our upcoming council meeting to please read the housing action plan. And uh, I know that Council, council President Holland, I want to speak to Brian. You have that one subject you want to talk about. Other than that, anything else? All right. Time now is 6.49, and we are adjourned. I'm going to hit the gavel. Thank you.